Hi everyone, welcome to part two of the Cotton Kingdom. So we have two questions to think about as we take a look at this segment of the Cotton Kingdom. When we take a look at the slave population of the South, there were roughly 4 million people who were enslaved in 1860, and they represented roughly half of the population of the cotton belt. So the area where most of the cotton was grown, you saw roughly half of the population enslaved. Slaves performed all sorts of tasks and jobs on the plantations and farms, but the vast majority of them worked in the fields. Taking a closer look at the life of the slaves, I wanted to concentrate on some categories, including community, family, and religion. First of all, with community, if you've seen movies like 12 Years a Slave, you get a sense of how living on a small farm or living on a plantation in the antebellum South created a sense of community, not just among the slaves, but along with the white populations as well. And so we see a difference here between those living on large plantations in the South and those living on small farms. On large plantations, a lot of times slaves were able to escape the watchful eye of the plantation owners and overseers, at least for part of the day. And so there's some sense of autonomy or normalcy within that existence. But for those living on small farms, a lot of times they lived under the same roof as their owners and overseers. So there was very little escape from that sort of oppression. The other thing to think about with large plantations is that the slave population tended to be more stable on a large plantation. And so children growing up on a large plantation often had the benefit of both of their parents being present. Now this does change if we consider geography as well. So in the Upper South, where trading and hiring out and the domestic slave trade had a greater impact, a lot of children would find one or both of their parents sold away, probably to the Deep South, or Couples would find that one partner is being traded out for the entire year and they don't get to see that person at all. So the idea of community and the idea of family is important in understanding how do people get through something like being held a slave. The other aspect of survival and coping had to do with religion. It's kind of interesting because during this period in history, the white population of the South was undergoing a revival and their version of Christianity was very angry in the sense that there was this fear of God punishing you if you sinned. And so a lot of the white preachers that were preaching to the white population would talk about the fire and the brimstone and you need to avoid hell so you avoid sin. And when the slaves had the opportunity to practice Christianity their own way, much of that was completely absent. Uh, they, they often talked about the struggle for freedom, about being free within their lifetime. Um, they talked about um, kind of the joy of life in the sense that um, your biblical hell doesn't scare me because I'm already living in hell. Uh, oftentimes the plantation owners would have white preachers preach to their slaves about obedience and doing their duty and that they would find freedom in the afterlife. Um, but like I said, sometimes slaves had the opportunity to have secret churches off in the woods behind uh, or beyond the view of the white population and they practiced their own version of Christianity. One of the things that students are often surprised to learn is that slave rebellions were uncommon. Um, we 
we always picture in our mind that if we found ourselves in this situation that we would fight, we would resist, we would do everything in our power not to be held as slaves. But the reality of the situation is that there was, there was very little slave rebellion going on. Most resistance, and I'm, I'm not saying that resistance is not common, but rebellion is not common. Resistance would take the form of uh, breaking tools or pretending to be sick or pretending not to understand instructions or simply working very slowly. Um, this was the way that slaves found that they could resist but yet not face any serious punishment or backlash from this. Uh, but we do have several examples of actual armed slave rebellions throughout American history. Uh, beginning here in 1800, this is not the first slave rebellion, but the first one we'll talk about. Uh, Gabriel Prosser was a slave in Virginia. And in 1800, he mobilized a band of his fellow slaves to march on the city of Richmond. But a storm blew up and prevented Gabriel's army from rising up. And the white population of Richmond discovered the plot and Prosser and 26 others were hanged and 10 additional people were deported to the West Indies or to the Caribbean. The largest slave revolt in American history, though, is in 1811 in Louisiana Territory. Charles de Long led several hundred slaves armed with guns, axes, and knives. Uh, they're, they're in this area between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, and they are making their way towards New Orleans, burning houses and killing whites along the way. It's going to take 300 soldiers of the United States Army along with armed planters and militiamen to finally stop the advance and to end the rebellion. Uh, Delon and most of the ringleaders were executed. In, in 1822, uh, whites in Charleston, South Carolina, uncovered an extensive and well-planned conspiracy organized by a free black man named Denmark Vesey. The plan was to seize local armories, to arm the slave population, and to take possession of the city. But once again, the plot was discovered and Vesey and many of the other planners were executed. The most famous slave rebellion in American history, though, takes place in 1831. We are in Virginia here. On August 22, 1831, the worst nightmare of Southern slaveholders became a reality when a group of slaves in Southampton County, Virginia, rose in open and bloody rebellion. Their leader was Nat Turner a preacher and prophet who claimed that God had given him a sign that the time was ripe to strike for freedom. Beginning with a few followers and rallying others as he went along, Turner led his band from plantation to plantation and oversaw the killing of nearly 60 whites. After only 48 hours, though, uh, the army and uh, white armed planters dispersed the slaves, the rebels were rounded up and executed along with dozens of other slaves who were vaguely suspected of going along with this. The most important thing to understand about Nat Turner's rebellion though were the repercussions. After Nat Turner's rebellions, a new series of laws strictly limited the rights of slaves to move around, to assemble without white supervision, or to learn even to read or write because the thought was that literacy would help the organization of rebellions. But there's other repercussions of Nat Turner's rebellion as well. Before this, there had been a, a relatively small but quite vocal group of abolitionists within the South. 
But after Nat Turner's rebellion, they were effectively silenced. And so many of them found it, it in their best interest to simply leave the South. The final thing to consider here with Nat Turner's Rebellion is the timing. It falls right in line with the nullification crisis. So we talked about the nullification crisis in 1832 and 1833. So why does South Carolina react so vigorously and violently to the tariff is because they're worried about maintaining the institution of slavery. When we take a look at how white Southerners have defended the institution of slavery, it's important to understand that there is a noticeable shift taking place in the first half of the 1800s. When we look back at the Revolutionary War generation, people often describe the institution of slavery as a necessary evil. When you take a look at Thomas Jefferson's writings, for example, he used this phrase often that, yes, we understand that slavery is inhumane, that slavery is wrong, but it is economically necessary for the future of the South. What happens as we get into the 1840s and 1850s is that Southerners are starting to argue that slavery is a good thing. Uh, according to George Fitzhugh, who is sort of the, the poster child or spokesperson for this viewpoint, the master-slave relationship was more humane than the one prevailing between employers and wage workers in the North. Uh, the argument, and I've included this in the topic resource folder, is that in the North, the factory owners don't really care about what happens to their workers because there is another boat coming from Ireland every single day. And so if the wage worker dies from a lack of food or overwork or a lack of housing, that's not my concern. I'll just hire new workers. But Fitzhugh's going to argue that slave owners have the well-being of their slaves in mind because he argues that it is, it is in their economic best interest to care for their slaves. So go back to the topic resource folder and read George Fitzhugh's essays. And then take a look at the slave narratives that I've included there. Some of them explain in explicit detail just how wrong George Fitzhugh was, how brutal the institution of slavery was, and how inhumane it was. Our questions to think about here, what was life like for the slaves in the southern states prior to the Civil War? Uh, it was brutal. It was dehumanizing. It was oppressive. But within that atmosphere, slaves found opportunities to build communities. Sometimes they had the, the family unit still present in their lives. Uh, also, religion played a key role in helping people mentally cope with the ordeal of slavery. And then how did Southerners defend the institution of slavery during a time when the abolitionist movement was growing in the North? As the abolitionist movement becomes stronger and louder, Southerners are going to get louder and more militant in their defense of slavery. And George Fitzhugh's essay is a perfect example of that.